Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jack Daly, director of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum, and it's my honor to welcome you to the 2013 Charles A. Lindbergh Memorial Lecture. The Lindbergh Lecture is an annual tradition in May here at the museum. And it was, uh, since 1982, this program has featured pioneers who represent the special qualities associated with Charles Lindbergh. Skill, determination, imagination, courage, and vision. It was 86 years ago today that he completed his historic nonstop solo flight from New York to Paris. It's nice that we, we try to do it in May, but to have it on the actual day is a special event for us. This evening program is made possible by United Technologies Corporation. Representing UTC tonight is Mr. Bennett Crosswell, president of Pratt & Whitney Military Engines. And Bennett, would you please stand up and be recognized? We are most grateful for UTC's support of this program. And I'm going to comment at this point, ladies and gentlemen, because people are asking us, how are you able to continue these programs during sequestration and all the things that are happening during the budget? And the answer is because all of these programs, everything we do, the, the family days, the super science Saturdays, the air and scare, the fly-in, are all sponsored programs. So were it not for these sponsorships, we wouldn't have this robust program that we have here at the Smithsonian. So, Bennett, thanks very much for making this possible. The, uh, each year we go through an extensive process to identify a distinguished member of the aviation community to share his or her versions, vi excuse me, vision, memories, and insights. We are guided in the process by the museum's mission, which is to commemorate, educate, and inspire. Tonight, we are honored to welcome Colonel Clarence E. Anderson as the 2013 Charles A. Lindbergh Lecturer. Better known as Colonel Bud Anderson, he represents the special qualities associated with Charles Lindbergh, exceptional skill, determination, and courage. Having distinguished himself as an aviator just 15 years after Lindbergh's flight, he stands as a living reminder of the extraordinary process progress achieved in flight over the decades. Like Charles Lindbergh, he is a legend in his own time. He was born in Oakland, California in 1922 and learned to fly at the age of 19. By the age of 22, he was flying combat missions in P-51s escorting heavy bombers into Germany. He is one of the few combat pilots to have flown in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. He has lectured at the museum in the past about his heroic experiences in battle, so tonight we have asked him to talk about the other part of his career, being a test pilot. In this capacity, he had some experiences that were unusual, like participating in an experiment flying the F-84 Parasite fighters modified to be launched and retrieved from the B-36 bomber. In addition to serving as chief of the fighter flight test section at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, he also served as Chief of Flight Test Operations and Deputy Director of Flight Test at the Air Force Flight Test Center at Edwards Air Force Base in California. He's a triple ace with 16 and a quarter victories. He has 116 combat missions to his credit and has logged more than 7,500 hours. He has flown 130 different types of aircraft and at age 91 is still an active pilot. Do you, should I mention that he also takes a co-pilot with him with these days? <laughs> Can I, tell, can I tell the story about that? At age 90, Bud uh, decided not to renew his medical, which would keep him from all of a sudden one day deciding he was going to go out and try it by himself. So this requires him, but he can uh, perform his duties as a flight instructor with a uh, rated pilot, not a student pilot. So he, but he is, and he flew a, steer, a steerman last week. So he's, he's our guy. The, um, Please give a warm welcome to Colonel Bud Anderson. Hey, can you hear me? <laughs> All right. I got to get organized here because uh, I'm talking about something different. I got to find my laser pointer because 
I'm going to have to use that quite a bit. And I may have to get around here and sit like this with my back to you. <laughs> so uh, please take that into consideration. Um, wow, what a crowd. Uh, you know, I've been here a couple times before, and I've given my World War II talk. And uh, uh, General Jack there says, uh, we'd like to have you back, but we want to have something different. Well, I've got hundreds of stories. <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk tonight about flight testings and during the Cold War. And, uh, and I'm really happy to be back here because that means I'm still around. <laughs> but actually, I'm getting at that age, you know, I don't care where I am, just as long as I'm here. <laughs> I'm okay, as long as I'm anywhere. So, um, first of all, I want to talk about, you know, how did, I, how did I get into the flight test business and a little bit about, you know, what, it, what it's like to be a test pilot. How did I get that particular job? And uh, some remarks about that so you'll understand that. And then we'll, uh, we'll talk about uh, the parasite fighter projects that the Army Air Corps and then the Air Force did later on. So I, I came home from uh, World War II and uh, you know the big deal was everybody was getting out of the service and uh, I, had, I had ten times as many points as you needed to get out immediately but I wanted to fly so I, stayed, I decided I would stay in the Air Force and I came back from my combat uh, before before the uh, war actually ended, and I went into the training command. And uh, then Germany fell, and then Japan fell in August. And they took uh, people with, that had combat records, and they put us in the recruiting service. You know, here's the end of the biggest war we've ever had. Everybody, it's all about getting out of the Air Force and just getting discharges and things like that. And I'm going to go out there and sell the Air Force, uh, sell the Army. It was the Army. I was in the Army then, not, not the Air Force. And it, it, was a, it, it was a kind of a lousy job as far as I'm con <laughs> concerned. <laughs> uh, but it was the beginning of when they uh, decided we're going to have a voluntary military service. And uh, it was a high priority, and once you got stuck in it, you couldn't get out. So I had to serve 18 months and going around in various post offices with a little office out there trying to convince young people to get in the service and those veterans to come back into the service. That was our big job. And uh, we finally, actually it worked pretty darn good. So, my 18 months is up, and uh, one of my squadron mates got me an interview with the uh, chief of flight test at uh, Wright Field, and based on, uh, on that, I was accepted at Wright Field. I'm just a pilot coming in, so what do you do? You go to the, the service test organization, and you fly for a little while, on kind of routine flying. And then after you've been there a while, they let you go to the, what they call the test pilot school in those days. It really was just a course. They gave you a course, a performance course, and then you went back to flying. And then if you did well, then they sent you to the stability and control course, and then you were fully qualified as a, as a test pilot, so to speak. So... Uh, I was in the service test organization and then uh, uh, went to the performance course and the civilian control course. Then I got to go to the fighter test section. And uh, now military test pilots, 
rarely get to do any real experimental flight testing. Now some of them do, but generally speaking, experimental flying is done by contractors or aircraft companies. And uh, in my case, I, uh, I got into two projects that were uh, very experimental and, uh, and, uh, and very interesting. And the, and the one of that uh, I did before, uh, first was a, a, where we coupled up the wingtips on, a, on airplanes. And uh, we, may, we may do that one sometime. It's hard to describe, and uh, I took the easy route out to give you a, something that everybody could understand. So uh, my boss said, well, I had done an awful lot of formation flying, and it really kind of came natural. So he says, well, we want you to do the, this parasite uh, fighter thing because it's, it's going to take some precision and uh, close formation, very close to airplanes. Then you touch them. <laughs> and so I get this project. And then that's one we're going to be talking about tonight. The, about test pilots. Uh, you might think that, uh, you know, test pilots are honored and revered as, uh, you know, great pilots. But the fact is, they're not universally liked. <laughs> Why? Because they bring up problems, right? The test pilots discover problems. And uh, project offices don't like problems. That's more money and time delay. Uh, the contractors particularly don't like it. And uh, so, you know, test pilots, they have to put up with them. You need them, but they turn up problems. And uh, it's, it's kind, of a, kind of a weird thing. So uh, the other thing about it was that I remembered that uh, in all those years working in the Air Force and with a, with, a, with a company, McDonald Company, if you have a test pilot or a test pilot organization, you don't want to put him underneath the engineering uh, division. Uh, test pilots need to report to the same guy that the engineering guys report to so they can be independent. If you work for the engineering guy, the guy that designed the airplane, and you say, hey, this is no good, the, the designer can override you, and you don't really know what's going on. So I found that that's, uh, it's, well, it's like quality control in a company. They need to report to the top so they can, can give you an honest report. And uh, the other thing is that, uh, People probably think that uh, a test pilot, well, this is really glamorous, you know, and uh, really, really important stuff. Uh, test flying is very strenuous and very, very dull and very routine. But, but like the off-used cliche, it has hours of boredom and moments of terror. It's probably a pretty darn good statement about flight testing. Uh, to give you an example, when I first got into it, uh, they gave me a project to fly a P-80 with blunt-sided ailerons. Say so your ailerons come down to a sharp point. Well, they had Blunt ones, you know, the back of the aileron was one, two, three inches, slab-sided thing. I think the space shuttle ended up with something like that. And they wanted to know how, what the rate of roll performance was in it. So here you take off in a clean P-80 or an F-80 later on, uh, short of fuel. You, you don't want to get lost and you want to get all this stuff done in a certain time. So you take off, you go to 10,000 feet, start out at your minimum speed, do a quarter roll, 
a half roll, three quarter roll, and a full roll. Each time at a stabilized airspeed and a stabilized altitude, and it gives you the rate of roll. Then you go up 10,000 more feet, repeat the same thing from minimum speed out to maximum speed, go to the third altitude, and then if you got enough fuel, you go to the fourth altitude, hurry up, turn around, and head back so you don't get lost while you're, you're busy in the cockpit. Uh, very tedious and, uh, and, and, and hard work. And I always thought, you know, I was flying instruments that I flew uh, pretty accurately. But after you got to the test pilot school, you know, hey, it wasn't plus or minus five miles an hour. It was the exact stabilized airspeed and zero tolerances. And you had to read the airspeed. We had bigger instruments, but it wasn't like 100, 105 rounded off. It would be 104.9 or 4.5 or whatever, whatever you could figure out. They really taught us how to fly accurately and it improved my instrument flying too then. <laughs> okay, enough about that. Uh, tonight we're gonna talk about the, oops, the FICON concept. And all that is, that's just an acronym for fighter conveyor. Uh, the idea was this was born in the 40s. And the first one was uh, to be a parasite on the giant B-36. Uh, the B-36 actually was, uh, in the, uh, you know, the concept came from World War II. What if we got run out of Europe and had to bomb Germany from the United States? And that was the requirement for the B-36. Then they said, well, if you do that, how are you going to have escort fighters? So the idea was that we would uh, put, a, put a fighter in the bomb bay of the B-36, and every fifth one would carry uh, one or two or whatever it was, and that would be the uh, idea. The, uh, the airplane was very radical. As you can see there, it, uh, it, it uh, had no landing gear. That's sitting on a cart. I think it was only something like 15 feet long. Had folding wings. There's the hook. And uh, once you got unhooked, then that thing retracted, folded down into the airplane. And that was gonna be the, uh, that was gonna be the fighter escort. So, um, now, we don't have a B-36, so they got a B-29 and uh, have this trapeze. It's shown there extended with, with the thing hanging down, getting ready to launch. Okay, it didn't have a landing gear, right? It had a skid on it. So the first flight, the guy had to launch from the B-29, go do it, his first flight, test it out, bring it back, hook it up, bring it back up in the B-29 and come in and land. That's a pretty big step. <laughs> and and uh, when I think about it now, uh, the airplane was a really a radical airplane too. So uh, next we're gonna, we're going to, uh, I'm gonna show you, this has sound to it, so it's kind of self-explanatory. Oops. Fighter conveyor, or FICON program. Military planners were concerned that the immense size and relatively slow speed of the B-36 would make it especially vulnerable to fighter aircraft. So, even before the B-36 was ready for service, they contracted with McDonnell Aircraft to produce a parasite jet, the XF-85 Goblin. It was intended that the Goblin be carried completely hidden in the belly of the B-36. In August 1948, this Goblin flight from a B-29 was a near-death experience for the pilot of the Goblin. In theory, the FICON concept was simple. In the event of a fighter attack, a 
parasite jet would be dropped from the bomber's fuselage by way of a trapeze mechanism. In the August test, pilot Ed Scorch flew for several minutes, but when he attempted to return to the mothership, violent turbulence knocked him into the trapeze. The goblin's canopy was broken, and Scorch's oxygen mask was ripped away. It was only with superb flying that Scorch was able to return safely to the desert below. However, the first Goblin prototype was damaged beyond repair. Despite this setback, the program was not canceled. The following October, the second Goblin prototype dropped from the Super Fortress and flew. Because of an improved training program, it hooked its trapeze without incident and was pulled into the mothership. But the concept presented more problems than it solved. The Goblin program was eventually scrapped. There was uh, two, two airplanes built uh, for the program. And as you learned, the, the, the first landing uh, uh, destroyed the airplane. And the second one, they made a total of uh, something like seven flights. And I think four of them ended up with belly landings. Uh, now, in my opinion, uh, I think what happened, we were trying to develop a very, very unique, different airplane, an experimental thing. And, uh, and then we were still we're trying to develop a trapeze launching and receiving system at the same time, doing that together. So uh, I think that contributed to the demise of that program. I didn't know the pilot that uh, flew on that, uh, but I don't imagine that airplane was very stable or very controllable to, you know, to make minor movements that you had to do to make successful engagements. Um, so the next, uh, the next, this was in the 40s. And then in the 50s, a uh, follow-on project was... Uh, Rider conveyor. Oh, was the or um, program okay was the the RB36 and the F84 uh, airplane uh, the the concept now was switched to let's take the long range of the B36 and made it with a fighter so you have the high speed we could send the B-36 out, then launch the fighter to take pictures, come back, and then go home. Uh, learning from experience uh, of the first thing, they said, "All right, let's uh, let's take a let's take a known airplane and uh, develop a launching and retrieving system, and then adapt the." Uh, the, the uh, mission airplane to it later on. So, what did we pick? Uh, we picked a, a standard, uh, been in the service for quite a while, F-84D, early model F-84 straight wing fighter. And we have a picture of it there. The prominent things that you're gonna see, of course, is the, is the nose probe. I've got some pictures of that. First, I want to identify a character here, Ben Holman, and there's a young Bud Anderson right there. These were the Air Force pilot, Air Force people involved in the project at the time. Uh, it was unusual. It was a contractor program. Convair at Fort Worth had it because that's where they built the B-36, and they modified the airplanes, and then the Air Force gave them an F-84, which they modified, and then they loaned me to the contractor, which was pretty unusual for those days. Well, for any days. And uh, now we're gonna look at, the, at some of the details of, uh, I particularly want you to remember Ben Holman because he probably saved my life. But let's look at this probe. Here it is. 
ties into the structure of the airplane here at the nose. And it had a unique uh, locking system. Why am I not getting that? There we go. Uh, now here on the, on the, uh, on the probe, there's, there's, the, uh, there's the latch. That's spring-loaded. So when you went into the receiver, which was like a big funnel, you went through, the latches slipped through, and then tripped open into the trough and locked you in place, and it towed you. Uh, go back and look at the uh, streamline. See there it's streamlined, and there it's in the spring-loaded position. You see that? that uh, you got to remember that because it's important. Uh, it's in something that happened. In addition, we, uh, we also put some explosive bolts in that thing so that if anything really went wrong, um, you, could uh, you could do that. You could get out of there. So now here we are. This is a, a description of, there's the, there's the boom, and you see it's a lot cleaner than the thing you saw in the B-29. And so you got lo less drag and less interference. The receiver was there on this cross arm. It, they called it a drogue, but it was like a, think of it as a funnel. And then uh, we came in here, and gradually pushed, pushed into that thing. And I have a picture here that you could also ground load the uh, F-84 into the B-36. And here's a photo taken of, taken of it inside the bomb bay of the B-36. And so you're looking at it from the F-84 uh, cockpit. There's that nose probe, the nose thing, the big long thing. There it's into that funnel, and then the locking mechanism is in there. And here's the boom, and here's the cross arm. I don't know what that lasso was for. I guess that was a backup system. <laughs> <laughs> so on, uh, on uh, January 9th, 1952, we went up to uh, make the first uh, the first, very first engagement. And we had decided to um, streamline the uh, lock, the, lock the, the little locks, the spring-loaded locks, make it streamlined. We, we could put them, hold them down so there was no lock. And we'd go in and engage it, and you stayed engaged by just keeping the power there and check it out. So uh, we did that on that day, and uh, and uh, there's a there's a picture. During flight tests with the long boom, initial contact was difficult because the drogue moved in a small eccentric circle. In addition. The drogue had a tendency to tumble unless the probe was engaged almost dead center. This was corrected by redesigning the drogue to make it self-centering. When attached to the single point position, the parasite aircraft proved to be divergently unstable in pitch. Due to this instability, the pilot was not able to maintain contact for longer than 30 seconds. As a result of these flight tests, it was decided that the vertical flexibility of the boom was causing the pitch instability. Now, you know what unstable means. <laughs> and when you say it was divergently unstable, that's bad news. <laughs> I'd go in there, plug it in, carry a little power, and then the airplane would start to pitch like this. And then I thought, well, oh God, am I, I'm trying to control it. Then I thought, oh, oh maybe I'm over controlling it and causing it to happen. So you let go of it and it got worse 
and then you get back on it, you couldn't control it, so you had to back out. Just pull it back to idle and back out. So that's what we did there. And uh, so the problem is, uh, is it's unstable. And one of the engineers said, well, maybe it's unstable because you're carrying the power pushing into that airplane. Maybe if you went in there and locked the mechanism and towed it, maybe it would be stable. Well, I didn't think it made much difference personally, and, uh, but what the heck, let's go try it. It didn't matter. Now I've got to tell you the side story, the Ben Holman story. Before we made the first flight, they had a flight safety review on the airplane. And he examined the, uh, the, uh, the probe. It had, a, it had a probe in the nose with uh, two ways of releasing it, manually or, or hydraulically by pushing a button. And the contractor claimed that that's redundancy. And he pointed out that, hey, the manual system uses one cable over a pulley. The hydraulic system uses the same pulley and the same cable. So it really is not redundant. So he insisted, tried to convince people that we better put explosive bolts in there. Nobody wanted to hear that. He came to me. And I didn't give him much support, so he went to my boss and my boss's boss, and he says, don't fly that airplane until the contractor puts explosive bolts in there. So we go up on the, uh, and, and they did that. It, it meant more money and a delay in the program. Not very popular. So, so we'll, all right, we're gonna go up now on the second, the second flight. And uh, I go up there, make the engagement, very smoothly went in, locked in. The airplane started to pitch. Oh my God, you know, it's no different. So I reached up and I hit the hydraulic button and nothing happened. I didn't even hesitate. I didn't go to the manual because I knew it wouldn't work. And I just hit the explosive bolts and, and dropped out of there. Came down and landed, investigated it. Guess what happened? The cable slipped off the pulley. You know, you, you, you wonder about these things. And, uh, and, I, and I didn't support him. And uh, I hate to think about what would have happened if we hadn't done that. There you're hanging on there underneath this big airplane and this trapeze tied up into the fuel cells and all that structure above. Hell, I couldn't eject. I couldn't even bail out. And you would have sashayed around there until something broke. And uh, I think it would have been a, a terrible disaster. So, we've got it uh, unstable while it's hooked up. Uh, so they said, let's, uh, Let's shorten that boom, bring it down to a shorter level, and maybe it'll be more rigid. And, um, and uh, so we'll go up and, uh, we'll go up and, uh, they'll shorten the boom. And to do that, of course, we had to, uh, we had to make a, a second, uh, a second probe. See, it wouldn't fit. You had, we had to put a, a second probe there back, uh, right in front of the windshield, by the way, which didn't make it a lot easier to do. And look at, look at this stuff. We tied it into the uh, jack points on the airplane with external tubing, and then back in here to, to get the strength from it. And uh, went up and flew it the first time. And I couldn't fly it above 200 knots. The thing buffeted so bad from all that drag and uh, stuff that, uh, and you wondered what it was doing to the structure of the tail because it was really buffeting if you go fast. 200, it was okay. Well, it's just, it's a temporary thing, so we would uh, go ahead with that. 
Uh oh. And now on the, uh, you need to know also where the, where the, see that pin right there? And there's another one on this side. Those are about a two and a half stainless steel pin that are tied to the structure of the airplane. And then when you raise that boom, it fits into this saddle here. And those, there's a locking there and a locking mechanism there where that goes right up in there and locks. So then you're locked in a three-point position. So we're ready to go check it again. In an attempt to eliminate this instability, the boom was shortened to reduce its flexibility. This change necessitated the installation of an additional probe just forward of the parasite canopy to accommodate the short boom. Flight tests with this configuration did not indicate any appreciable improvement in the instability problem. You, you could tell instantly, as soon as you got in there, the airplane would start that pitching. You probably could see it. Uh, it doesn't look too bad, but let me tell you, when you're sitting in that airplane <laughs> uh, and you knew about airplanes and things like that, it could have got out of hand very quickly. So uh, now we... Uh, Oh yeah, now another thing. Uh, we decided, well, how are we gonna get this thing so rigid that, that, uh, that uh, we know it works? If it doesn't work, you know, the program's canceled. So they knew that the strongest point was right here. And so they could actually, when it's down, they could actually apply a hydraulic pressure and make it even stiffer. So he said, let's, let's, uh, let's mount the um, receiver. Oop. I'm not getting this right. Okay, there we are. Now we're, we took a, a, a structure and put the receiver right in the middle of it and then mounted it in those two uh, locking points in that saddle, the back part of the, of the, uh, of the uh, thing. And then we went up and uh, now we're gonna, boy, this thing is sensitive. Uh, we're gonna use the nose probe because it was a lot easier to engage the nose probe than it was that second probe because that thing was right in your face. So uh, let's take a look at uh, how that worked. The drogue receiver was then temporarily installed between the aft latches on the boom in order to determine if a rigid installation would solve the problem. At this location, Hydraulic pressure could be maintained on the trapeze to provide almost infinite vertical stiffness. With this configuration, the parasite was stable during single point contact. These flight tests demonstrated that pitch instability could be eliminated, provided the vertical stiffness of the boom could be adequately increased. I have to tell you a little story about it. This is the days before we had simulators. If we did this today, we'd put that in a simulator. And uh, one of the engineers divided, d devised a way of simulating this thing. And uh, he got a, a brown recorder, if you know what that is, and it's, it's a big sheet of paper, and it has a, a, a little needle, like a, like a seismograph thing and he had a line down the middle. He set it on a table, I set a card table, and gave me a kitchen chair, and they had a set of rudders and an aileron uh, stick, and he said, if you can fly toward that thing and keep it on the, on the line, uh, then we'll know how strong it has to be. And uh, 
I call it the kitchen table and the, the card table <laughs> and a very primitive uh, simulator for those days. And we got it stiff enough. Uh, we knew we had to, how stiff it had to be, but that was a way of double checking it. And uh, so then how did we solve the problem? We attached a stubber from the boom up to the bulkhead of the B-36, a hydraulic snubber. Uh, that was the fix, and now we're going to see a film of how that works. Boom, and the front of the RB-36 Bombay. The snubber strut prevents sudden changes in the position of the boom, but does not hinder slow motions which occur during retraction or extension. From the retrieving operation, the F-84 pilot lines the probe up with the drogue on the boom. He then increases speed to accomplish the single point attachment. Uh, the, um, it, was, it was successful, it was it's stable, worked, and so now we're ready for the first full cycle where we go up hook up, there's the hook up, and then what we're going to do is uh, you come in here, hook up, then raise this boom up, and that'll make it fit here. This saddle will come down over there and snap over the two pins that I told you about, and then from that point you go straight up inside the uh, You get up to that point, now you're locked in three places, shut the engine down, and tell the boom operator to, to uh, take you straight up into the airplane. Uh, now, when uh, I'm gonna go back one slide and explain, well, we can do it with this slide right here. Uh, there's a feature on this thing that was built into it. When you're right here, Say if you were up in the Bombay and you're going to release the airplane, you bring it down to here, you start the engine, and then you uh, release the aft latches, and then the boom comes down, and then you're free, and then you release the nose boom and you drop away. Well, there was a feature on it that if you forgot to release these uh, rear latches or the boom operator, the boom operator could do it or I could do it. The first couple of degrees of uh, movement on the boom automatically release those aft latches. So uh, we're ready for this uh, first time. I go in, plug in, uh, nice good plug. Uh, nice good plug in, pull up to that position there, and I tell them to go ahead and pull me up into the Bombay. Now, uh, this was an early hydraulic system, so they slowed the B-36 down to a slow speed so there wouldn't be so much drag on the, on the, uh, on the hydraulic motors when they pull it up. So I'm below the stall speed of the F-84 at this point. And, uh, as we went up into the Bombay, my head was just getting into the Bombay, and all of a sudden, I hear the second loudest noise I've ever heard in an airplane. I drop out of the airplane sideways, and then the other side comes off and went over this way and back. I heard a crash behind my head. I didn't know what it was, and I think it was like 1.2 milliseconds. I released it and dropped out of there. Now here I am. This is at 10,000 feet. I don't have any engine running. And uh, I was pretty excited. <laughs> 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 and, and I pushed the nose down. You had to get the nose down quickly or you're gonna stall. And to get that engine rotating again and getting some airflow through the, through the duct, then you hit the air start switch and come up with the throttle. 
and the engine would start and you could go land. Okay, so I get it rotating. If the air start, open the throttle, nothing happened. And I thought, oh boy, you know, and I'm losing altitude like crazy. And I said, well, looks like I'm gonna have to belly this thing in. And I shut the throttle down because you're dumping fuel back into that tailpipe. And I'm, I'm going around and say, well, I better set up a procedure for a, a dead stick landing, laying out in a cornfield somewhere. Procedure, wait a minute. This is an F84D, an early model. And to get an air start, you had to reach up and turn to an alternate inverter. Oh my God. I reached up there, turned it over, hit the air start and popped the engine, brought the throttle out. I still had an awful lot of fuel in that tailpipe. <laughs> and the guys in the B-36 said it looked like a torch about 100 feet behind me. But it was turning and burning, so I got the airplane down and, uh, and, uh, and we uh, analyzed that problem. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what happened? The, uh, the snubber pushing down on the, on the uh, boom, when it came up, it pushed that thing down just enough to release one of those pins. And that put a full load on that other side. And that noise I heard with that two and a half inch stainless steel bar snapping, it was loud. So we got a problem. Pretty easy, eliminate the, uh, eliminate the automatic. Now you're gonna see a normal operation. After the initial hook on has been made, oh, we got a nice the trapeze operator oh, actuates oh, the boom yet. up switch, which raises the parasite to a point where the aft latches are engaged. There to maintain see. alignment of the F84E between the aft latches of the boom, the trapeze operator directs the pilot of the parasite to move right or left. Mechanical indicators visible to the trapeze operator and green lights visible to the pilot of the parasite indicate when the aft latches are locked. to the retraction from the extended position, the engine of the F-84E is shut down. Actuation of the trapeze up switch then hydraulically retracts the main lifting jack to raise the parasite to the stowed position. position, the pilot of the F-84 opens the canopy and steps out onto a catwalk in the bomb bay of the RB-36. After closing the canopy, the pilot proceeds along the catwalk and enters the camera compartment of the carrier. Okay, um, so now we got a workable system. And, uh, so we took that big hay rake off and uh, put a nice clean uh, probe on there. The airplane flew a hell of a lot better. And uh, we were able to, to uh, continue the tests uh, to open the envelope, see how slow you could uh, hook up, how fast you could hook up, how high we could hook up and then do the structural loads on the, on the trapeze, uh, fully test it so it would be ready for operational use. Um, I'm stuck, okay. I go. After the initial hook on has been made, the trapeze operator actuates the boom. There we go. Here's a diagram of the final test configuration. And uh, there's the new snubber. Here's the long boom. You're in the extended position. 
where you uh, started your engine or shut it down, depending on which way you're going, and then you brought it up into the Bombay through this mechanism right here. Uh, this is the central part of the B-36, and there's thousands of gallons of fuel in this area. So, you know, think again about that f first flight with the, without the explosive bolts. I think it would have been pretty disastrous. And uh, then you go up to the uh, extended, extended position, shut the engine down, go up into the bomb bay. Uh, on the production airplanes, they would uh, put some sh shield, shielding, not shielding, but uh, fairings in here to cut the wind blast and the drag. Uh, the, the, uh, And uh, here's one of it uh, all the way up in there. Okay, so you know, now we've kind of proved the system. And now I've got concerns about it. Uh, I'm wondering if a, a squadron pilot could be able to do this on a daily basis. Uh, low experience guy, uh, pilots. Uh, if you had turbulence, you almost couldn't even think about doing it. And uh, to tell you to, to, to tell you the truth, or not the, to, what, to to tell you how how what what it was like, a B thirty six is a huge airplane. How many have, have any of you ever seen a B thirty six or heard one? Okay, well you know what I'm talking about. When that thing went across the ground, it left a sound wave, a very peculiar sound wave. It made an incredible noise. So you got this thing up ahead of you. And you came in like this, slowly came in. When you went through that propeller plane, you know, where the pushers were, you could feel that thing beating on your chest, the vibration. They had to carry so much power because the F-84 is flying slow and it's going as fast as it can. It's going like this and I'm going like this. And you got up there just about, well, you got through the propeller plane, and then you got a trim change. How many pilots we got in here? Yeah, okay, you got, I got a, this airplane, it, the interface of the airplane sucked the airplane up toward the Bombay. I mean, it was, it was noticeable. <laughs> and it, you, so you, woo, you know, you gotta catch it right there, fly it very carefully. And just before you got to the, the receiver, it dumped you off. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, took some, it took some flying to do it. Now, I personally didn't think it was any harder than uh, probe and drogue refueling, and, but uh, I voiced my concern. Oh, man, and that, that causes a lot of things. It says, well, God, we're watching you. You look like you're on a fishing line, and we're just coming in there, go in. No big deal. I said, well, it's not a big deal. <laughs> I could have said nothing and just let it happen, but I said, we need to figure out a better way to do this. So they wanted to confirm it. They didn't, well, they believed me, but they didn't believe me, you know. So we got another pilot from Wright Field and two guys from Eglin from the proving ground, they were all able to hook up, but they all said, look, can't we do something easier? So the, the uh, fix was a fork system. Now I'm showing it to you on the, that thing is touchy. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, I gotta go one back. There we are. This is the prototype XF-84F, uh, the fighter model. It had a nose uh, nosed up for the engine, and uh, we had to modify it, and here's what they came up with, a fork system. And we had a vertical fork on the fighter, and then on the boom, we had a horizontal fork. So you'd come in like this, and you can see how that would work. So if you're off a little bit, it would bounce to the middle and lock in. 
worked pretty good. We all flew it and said, okay, yeah, it's a little bit better. And uh, I tell you, I don't understand this thing. I just touch the keg and it changes. <laughs> there it is. There we are. Uh, uh, about that time, uh, I had uh, I left the program. I was actually in the Pentagon, but they called me back, and I made the first ten flights uh, with the with the with the with the swept wing prototype to verify that it was okay. We hooked up. They're just about to hook up. Now you're hooked up up in the Bombay, and there's a overall picture of the thing. So now we pretty well got it tested as far as the system goes. So they, uh, another pilot took over from there. And here's a picture of the, uh, of the production airplane that's going to do the, uh, uh, the mission airplane. This is a F-84F, the reconnaissance model. And it, uh, I got to go back it up one there. There you are. They, uh, you can see that. There's there's the hook, and by the way, that retracts down into the into the airplane, so it's uh, smooth. See that a photo nose? Here's where the cameras are. It had a root duct here for the engine, one on each side, and of course it had pins here too. And notice the bent tail. The, t the tail was normally horizontal this way. It was bent down so it would fit up inside the Bombay. They uh, checked it out in flight. And then we also had a ground loading pit uh, where, you could, where, you, where you could load this thing on while you were on the ground. And then the B-36 could take off uh, with the airplane loaded and the pilot just riding along. A funny thing about it was you took off and the landing gear of the B-36, uh, you had to take off, extend the fighter, suck the gear up, and then bring the fighter up. <laughs> Otherwise it would hit the wing on the, uh, on the airplane. What do you want to note here? You can see there's the vertical fork, there's the horizontal fork. Again, there's the cameras, the root duck, the pins, and here's the uh, saddle. There's the long boom. And uh, note the tail back here, bent down like that. Flight tests were complete. Um, it was challenging. Uh, they modified uh, uh, I think it was a half a dozen. I, I kind of lost track of the project at that time. But I think they modified something like six uh, B-36s and uh, uh, 25 fighters. The concept, you got to remember this is the Cold War, right? And we were doing everything we could to uh, get an advantage. And, uh, you know, we had prototypes and uh, investing in schemes like this. But there was also a lot of other things going on, like satellites, and U-2s, and things like this. So when uh, time came for the Strategic Air Command to take these airplanes and make it operational, it was dead on arrival. Oh your taxpayer dollars at work? I don't know. Let me tell you what, it was, a, it was a challenging program, and I think it's a good example of why we flight test, you know, things that can happen and stuff like that. Uh, there's only uh, three of these airplanes left. They, they, they trashed them all. There's one in uh, the Air Force Museum. There's one in... Uh, Chino, California, and the one in Colorado. That concludes my talk.
and uh, if we've got the time, we can ask questions. Now, let's not limit it to this. If you, if you want to talk about World War II or anything, uh, I'm willing. Okay, that's a deal. <laughs> You've been a great audience. Thank you very much. You've got two old guys down here, and we can't, either one of us here. So the questions speak up, and if we can't hear them, maybe we can relay them down. We'll start with a close one then. Would you share your story about your very last mission in the P-51 in Europe? I don't think I want to. <laughs> the answer is no. <laughs> we got time? I don't know. How long a story is it? <laughs> yeah, we have time. Okay. Well, as the story goes, um, uh, first I have to tell you that I was on a second tour. I'd finished a tour, I'd come home on a 30-day r and &R, and I'm going back for a second tour that was strictly volunteer. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I went through the redistribution center in New Jersey, where you have to pass through for administrative procedures, they sent me to a shrink. <laughs> and the shrink wanted to know, he says, listen, you do not have to go back to combat. You've already done your thing. We got thousands of pilots that haven't flown combat yet. Do you understand that? And I said, yeah. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> so I went back. And about that time, um, one of my squadron mates, uh, who's well known in the aviation industry, uh, had been shot down in the march and escaped in, to Spain with the Free French. Then he came back to, they, they traded him for some gasoline, I think it was. <laughs> and uh, he came back to England, they identified him, and he said, I want to finish my combat tour. He had to go all the way up to General Eisenhower to get that permission. Well, now we've already invaded France, and it was a little bit different situation. The thing being, you know, if you were escaped from Germany or German-occupied country and the French helped you and you're supposed to be interned in Spain, you know, the, the Germans could put pressure on Spain or they could say, no, you're not uh, who you say you are, you're a spy, we can kill you. Or make him tell, you know, how the free French operated. So he's, he's uh, back to finish his first tour, finish his tour, and I'm back there doing my second tour. So it comes uh, January, um, I know I'm going to finish in January, we're going to finish somewhere in January, both of us, and he came to me and he says, let's, let's fly our last mission together and uh, then maybe we can go home together as, uh, and continue our friendship. So. Uh, we, uh, I said, well, I'm the operations officer. I can, I can make that happen. And uh, got a little closer to the time. And so he says, uh, you know, it sure would be hell if you got shot down on your last mission. He said, I got a plan. He said, you know, we've flown over Germany and down. We see the Alps out there. And it's such a beautiful country. Let's go down there and go out as spares. Uh, you send 16 airplanes out, you send two guys behind, and the spares are supposed to fit in, you know, if somebody aborts. Nobody aborts, he says, let's go down and go sightseeing. <laughs> now, spares are supposed to turn around and come home. It's not a counter. It's, it doesn't count as a combat mission. So, the day comes, mid-January 1945, and now, I gotta say, in these days, we were seeing no Germans, day after day after day. They would save their fuel, and uh, then they would launch hundreds of airplanes all at once. And then you'd see maybe 200, 300 airplanes in one day, one, one raid, one spot. So, you know, it was milk run after milk run after milk run, and then maybe an exciting mission. 
So we looked at the mission, it was pretty deep, and we didn't care, you know, hey, this is our last mission, let's, let's, let's do it. So we get out, we cross the channel, nobody aborted, nobody turned around, so we're by ourselves. We turn, head for Switzerland, and uh, they go deep into Germany. Now, we have the old two, four channel VHF radio, so it's, we're separated from a little bit. We can't hear them talking, and they can't hear us talking. So we're going down, and uh, Chuck says, uh, hey, there's Mount Blanc down there. He said, uh, let's go down there and drop our tanks on them, on Mount Blanc, and strafe them and see if we can set them on fire. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait a minute, you know. We've already done enough stuff here to get court marshaled. I don't know, what, you know. I'm a very responsible 22-year-old major. <laughs> okay, let's go. <laughs> uh, we dropped our tanks and we shot our guns. I don't think we set them on fire. Uh, then we went down, we buzzed all over down in, in the area. Northern France was still occupied. We came home all the way on the deck back just having a great time flying spread so we could see each behind each other. We're the last two airplanes to get home. <laughs> Everybody's back. And I landed, and I said, ah, you know, I'm well done. And I'm taxiing back, and I look in my hard stand. There's all these people in my hard stand. And I thought, God, how the hell did they find out about this already, you know? <laughs> I'm really worried. My heart sank, and, and I thought, no, 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 last mission. They're here to pat me on the back, you know. I land, circle in, cut my engine, swung the tail around. My crew chief jumps up on the wing, and he says, Andy, the group shot down 57 airplanes today. How many did you and Chuck get? <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so we're here. Right over here. You said that that bolt was the second loudest sound you'd heard in your cockpit. What was the first loudest sound? Oh, you said the bolt that cracked was the second loudest sound you'd heard. Yeah, the loudest the noise I ever heard in an airplane. Well, um, um, I got to, I, I was sent to Edwards from right field to Muroc, as they call it in those days. And I was gonna make a flight in that uh, new prototype swept wing uh, F-84F. And I, the idea was well, I was gonna check it out and see if it was appropriate for, for the, it was just an excuse so I could get to fly it. It had a hand-built uh, British engine in it. And I went there and got a briefing from the, from the uh, the, the contractor, and Rusty Roth, their, their test pilot, he says, you know, this thing is, is a little rough. He says, when you go through 25,000 feet, the engine's going to sh shake and vibrate a little bit on you. But just press on. It'll be okay. We've done it several times. Didn't have a hell of a lot of time on the engine, actually. So I'm taking off. My uh, buddy Dick Johnson gets an F-86, uh, and he's going to fly with me. So we're flying out, and he's flying close formation. He's stuck right in there with me. We go up through 25,000 feet. The engine got rough. I pressed on, and it got rougher. And all of a sudden, kaboom! The loudest noise I've ever heard in an airplane. <laughs> and what had happened, the compressor, the, the fixed part of the, the stators, hit the rotating part of the of the compressor, and you can imagine what that did to the engine. Uh, so the <laughs> it's really funny, because uh, all the red lights in the airplane went on, all the, the gauges all went up in the red, and Dick Johnson was flying formation like this, and he went <laughs> like this. <laughs> and later I said, what the hell did you do that for? He says, hell, I thought you were going to blow up. <laughs> and. Uh, so I stopped cockpit and okay, it's flying all right. And this is the beauty of Edwards Air Force Base for flight testing, to have that beautiful 
big dry lake out there and you know be able to land anywhere you want as fast as you could want it to go come in and land and and I'm stopped I'm waiting for the fire trucks they got to come about five miles to come down and get me and so I said well I'm going to climb out and I climbed out and reached up and looked down in the duck and there was all these uh, blades the compressor blades and things that laying in the bottom. They looked like spare ribs laying in the bottom of the thing. That thing really destroyed itself. And that's the loudest noise I've ever heard in an airplane. Okay, right up here. What gave you your motivation to become a test pilot, sir? What was your motivation to become a test pilot? Was that, okay, what was your motivation? We do this so we get it on tape. What was your motivation to become a test pilot? Um, you didn't like recruiting? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anything but recruiting, I guess. Uh, I thought it might be interesting. You know, I'd done combat flying, and uh, I, I don't know. You know, why did I want to be a fighter pilot? I, I, I saw newsreels and things like this and watched the Battle of Britain. It probably brought me on. Test piloting. Uh, I, uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I brought my to fly in flight book, sir. Can you sign it? He'll do it right after the show. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but nice try. Yes, I'll, <laughs> I'll sign it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Can you compare the uh, Mustang to the Corsair? Can Could you I compare the Mustang to the Corsair? No. <laughs> They're both great airplanes. I flew, uh, I did fly a Corsair one once, a, an FG-1, the one built by Goodyear. And uh, I thought it was a great airplane. Uh, they had put a yaw damper on it to uh, make it better and for ground strafing, make it a little more stable. Uh, the Mustang was a, you know, it was a great airplane for what it did. I think the Corsair was a great airplane for what it did. Uh, that's the trouble when you compare airplanes. You know, the Spitfire was built to fight right over the field. Uh, the Mustang, I could set up a scenario, say, okay, we've got to fly 500 miles, and then we're going to have a dogfight and then 500 miles back. Spitfire can't even make it. So, you know, it's, uh, airplanes are designed for different things, and uh, they're, all, they're, all, they're all good at what they do. Okay, do we have a question from the planetarium? Not, a, not everybody is in here tonight, but we have some folks oh, in the planetarium. If, speak, uh, step up to the mic and ask the question if you have one. Yeah, I have a question since okay. you were... Uh, you were at Wright-Patterson and, uh, and Edwards also. Did you have any dealings with that F-84 that had the uh, prop on the front? That I think it was supposed to be a supersonic uh, tip turboprop. No. <laughs> Screech. No, I never even got near it. Okay. <laughs> any other questions in the planetarium? Um, it's it's very very well reported that you had the gifted eyesight, and um, you were very fortunate that way. Uh, how big a factor was that? Uh, do you think in your combat missions? And I know that that played a key role in all your successes. So. What, what advantage was good eyesight as a fighter pilot? Oh, what what advantage is a good eyesight? Tremendous advantage. <laughs> this is before radar and stuff like that. So the only way you could see your enemy was through your eyeballs. And, uh, uh, and I don't know. I had, uh, everybody had to have 20-20 vision. Uh, I didn't know at the time, but I had 2015 in one eye and 2010 in the other. But they usually test you to 2020, and they say, okay, you pass. But later on, I found out that I had better than 2020 eyes. Not sure that's a complete thing. There's a knack about seeing airplanes in the distance. And uh, the other thing is you, you have to want to see them. <laughs> Can you imagine guys going on a, a combat tour and never seeing an enemy airplane? We had a few of them. Uh, but I don't know. We, uh, 
you, you develop techniques. You could see the guy turns and the sun flashes on the canopy or something like that, and you watch him. You know, they, your wingman is important because he clears your back. You don't lose him. You follow him, follow him, follow him, follow him. And uh, I forget other little techniques. I had a way of searching. You know, I'd search and search, 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 try to look thoroughly at it, focusing my eye on the infinity out as far as I can. And I could see them. Uh, other guys, I'd say, there they are, you know, uh, 11 o'clock level. We'd be on the way, getting ready to attack before they saw them. Uh, it's just, it, I, th I think certain people can do that. I found a lot of the aces had very good eyesight. Now, having said that, I also have been flying along, searching, 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 and a whole squadron of, <laughs> a whole squadron of P-47s flies through us, you know. <laughs> Who knows? Okay, go ahead. Have you ever met any of your former World War II adversaries? Have yes. you ever met any of your former World War II adversaries? Yeah, German pilots. Uh, I wouldn't take the time of day for about 20 years uh, to meet a German. But uh, then I did, and uh, I met several. Um, Delan, who's a very famous one. Uh, I personally found him still kind of arrogant. <laughs> you know, like, we didn't lose the Battle of Britain, we just quit. <laughs> uh, stuff like that. Then, uh, the guy I really got to know and could talk to, very, uh, you know, face-to-face -face friend, was Gunther Rall. The guy, he had 275 victories, most of them on the Eastern Front. Uh, I've been to his house in Bavaria, and I found out he's a warrior, you know. <laughs> he wasn't a Nazi. And uh, it's kind of interesting. Then he, you know, we'd ask each other questions. He said, you know, when I was flying in the Battle of Britain, we were going out towards England. We see those contrails up there. And he says, I got guys, that, hey, uh, I got a rough engine. Uh, oh, my oxygen system's uh, failing back here. He says, you have those kind of guys? <laughs> and I says, yeah, we had a few of them. <laughs> and then he has a really funny story to say. You know, people ask, why do the German pilots have so many kills? You know, he had 275 kills. And they got lots of them. They're, he's number three, number three in history. Uh, and he said, uh, he had a good prepared answer for it. He said, well, you know, we started flying. We had, a, we had the Luftwaffe. We had so many pilots. We started flying in 19, when they went down to Spain. And he said, then we invaded, you know, uh, Poland and things like this. He said, every time we took off, we had multiple targets. We had a target-rich environment. There was, and especially late, later on when the 8th Air Force came in. And uh, he said, in his German accent, he said, the German pilots had a choice. You either got an iron cross or a wooden cross. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. Yeah, I've got to t tell a Gunter Rall story, because a good friend of yours, Don Lopez, yeah. who used to host the, and we had Gunter in here one night, and they were in the question and answer, and Don said, Gunter, when you fired the guns in the Messerschmitt, did you get smoke in the cockpit? Because when I flew the P-38 and fired the guns, I got smoke in the cockpit. And without hesitation, Gunter says, nah, if you do it right, the other guy gets smoke in the cockpit. <laughs> <laughs> We've got time for one more question. <laughs> Okay. Loud. All right, go ahead. Could you please describe supersonic flight? Could I describe it? Well, you flew rocks, you flew jets. What was it like? What, what was supersonic flight like? Yeah. Well, Can you describe supersonic flight? Is that, that right? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, 
um, supersonic flight today is a piece of cake. You take off, put it in a burner, and you go supersonic. And you're sitting there like you're in a rocking chair. <laughs> Uh, they found out how to design out all the, the trim changes you got when you go through. But I'll tell you, taking an F-86, a subsonic uh, swept-wing jet fighter, supersonic, uh, it could only do about 0.88 in level flight. But you could take it in a dive and you could get it just barely supersonic. And the way he did that was you went to the highest altitude you could get. Say, go up to above, above 40. Get it going as fast as you could in level flight. Roll it over gently. Don't pull a lot of G on its back and let it come down like that until you're going vertical, full power. So you're coming down like this. The airplane starts to buffet. Then you get a wing roll and then it would straighten out, and you flew okay. Then you'd get down here, you'd get a tuck, and then you'd get a pitch up, kind of like that. You had to control it uh, there. With the flying tail, where the whole tail moved, it was a piece of cake. With the early F-86s, you had to use the trimming, the horizontal t t trimming function of the thing to gain control. Uh, after you did it a few times, it was a, no big deal. Thank you, sir. Yes, thank you, sir. Thanks very much, my friend. Great, <laughs> great presentation. In 2007, in recognition of the anniversary of Charles Lindbergh's historic flight, the sculptor Don Wiegand created two bas-relief works of art. The works, one of Charles Lindbergh and the other of the Spirit of St. Louis, were accessioned into the National Air and Space Museum collection, so they're a part uh, of our art collection. The Wiegand Foundation is a partner with the Charles A. and Ann Morrow Lindbergh Foundation. Based on this, his sculpture, Mr. Wiegand created a special commemorative medal. And since 2007, we have ended this program with a presentation of this medal, and it's my honor at this time to present one to you, bud. Oh, wow. The, uh, the box is great, too, by the way. Let's see. <laughs> Let's see if I can get this. Hell, the box is a piece of work yeah, it itself. Is. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. My, All right. You, can, you probably can't. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. That's perfect. And the, the Wiegand Foundation is represented here tonight by Miss Krista Dubb. And we thank you very much for the support and the, these magnificent, there's only six others, is it, Eli? So this is really a, a very significant collector's piece. Thank you. And um, Colonel Anderson will be available to sign copies of his book in the Milestones of Thought Gallery down in the main level. And uh, I want to once again thank United Technologies Corporation for sponsoring tonight's program. We appreciate it very much. Thank all of you for coming and ask that you exit via the rear of the theater. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.